Good afternoon. Um, so first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank Professor Peng for, for giving the chance to, to invite me here and to give me a chance to share with you some of our ideas. So I'm talking about uh, remeasuring age and aging, and this is basically joint work together with my uh, colleague Warren Sanderson. So I'm going first to give some brief introduction into the issue. Uh, and then uh, I give some general definitions of, of current definitions of age. Uh, we talk about some new measures uh, and we see how aging will look like once we deal with, once we, once we apply some new measures. And uh, at the end we have some conclusions. So first of all, everyone knows that aging is considered to be extremely big thing these days. It's like these are some of headlines. Aging population poses global challenges. It's significant threat to global prosperity. And headlines in all newspapers, journals like Economist, it's just they're very well known. World Bank. But before talking about aging, we have first to define what is population aging. According to United Nations report on world population aging. Uh, population aging is a process by older individuals become proportional large share in population. Or aging of population is a summary term for shifts in age distribution of a population toward older ages. These are some very general definitions. Definitions is not enough, we have to measure aging. And that's the way how aging is measured. Aging of population is often measured by increases in percentage of older people of retirement ages. Median age is also another measure, which is probably one of the most popular used. Uh, median age uh, is age where half population is below this age, half population is above this age. And we are talking that aging occurs when, when median age rises. So these are, general, uh, these are measures of population aging. And of course, one of the most actually popular also these days measures of aging is old age dependency ratio. That's where we have all headlines. Old age dependency ratio is growing and because it is, it is related to social security systems, to burden on working population. Now, the biggest problem is how we define who is old. Because it's just we are talking about older population, but who is old? Now, uh, United Nations in most of the cases would define that people about age 60 are old. In European Union, for example, 65 will be used. But it's always fixed. So all calculations are done for the fixed age. So you think 65 year old is old. Today, 100 years ago, 100 years from now, it's always 65, and that's it. And that's dependency ratio. Now, how population aging looks according to this traditional definition? Well, this is just from some of our projections for, for Europe. This is proportion 65 plus, 2011. It all changes. It becomes all very different color in, in 50 years from now, with, with, the, with the most dark areas up to 68, 63% of population at age 65 plus. Same happens with median age. It grows in all the countries and it becomes above 50 and even more in some countries, which means half population below this age, half population is older than 50, say two in some countries. That's projected. Now, let's see what we can do with this? What are some other ways of looking at aging? So the literature of a on aging is exploding, but the concept that is, which is used is still the same. So, example, let's look at the person who is age 60. Is he old, very old, or he is middle ages? Uh, probably today, most of the people would say, well, it's probably middle aged person. But if you look 150 years ago, that was an extremely old person because very few people would survive until this age. Only about, in, in Western Europe, only about 20-25% of men would survive until age 60. Today, it'd be more than 93%, 95% would survive until age 60. So, why the same person is very old at the same chronological age at some time and, very, and middle ages today? Because traditional age measure is a backward-looking measure. It only looks at how many years a person lived. And it doesn't look into the future. It doesn't look at the changes in life expectancy. Young and old is relative compared to life expectancy. Life expectancy is a reference point. 
Well, basically, with my colleague Warren Sanderson, we introduced a new measure of age into publications in nature and science, uh, which we call prospective age. So it is very important to look, to have some measure which is linked to, to the future, to remaining life expectancy. Because many decisions people make are dependent upon roughly how long they think they may, may still to go. People may buy a house if they, are, if they know that there's still some time that they're going to live. People study if they know that they can still you know, use this study. So I had students at age 50. It was impossible to have 100 years ago. Okay, now, perspective, perspective age basically measures how old people are not from the date of the birth, but in relation to their life expectancy. So basically we define people as having two ages, chronological age, all people who have the same population who have the same age, uh, chronological age, live exactly the same number of years. In contrast, prospective age is concerned about future, and everyone or all populations that have the same prospective age have the same remaining life expectancy. To a certain extent, this is like constant dollar in economics. No one is measuring prices like this cost 150 years from uh, ago. Certain amount, and we're not comparing to what it costs today because we have to take inflation into account. We usually measure things in constant dollar terms. To a certain extent, the same thing we are using in, in, in this approach. But in economics, you use price indexes to, 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 to calculate inflation. Here, we use, demographers use life tables. So that's why we also need some standard year it's, it's a reference here. And for example, uh, all people who have prospective age 40 have the same remaining life expectancy as 40 year person in standard year. And just to illustrate this, this is a case of England and Wales. Uh, here, uh, the standard year is taken 1900. So what we are saying that all people, all those women and all those men have exactly the same prospective age and it's age 40 if it is measured by the standard 1900. Why? Because all of them at those ages have exactly the same remaining life expectancy. So at age 40, they had remaining life expectancy in 1927.4, and in 1900, they have the same remaining life expectancy at this age. Now, how the picture then looks like? So here we have United Kingdom. These are ISO lines, ISO lines. So each line shows that a person at age 40, in 2000, had certain remaining life expectancy. People at all those time points had different age when they had exactly the same life expectancy. So for example, okay, let's look at the next one, this is Japan. Okay, someone at age 40 had fixed remaining life expectancy. I'm not talking which one, I'm saying some certain life expectancy. All those people at those ages had exactly the same life expectancy. Like someone in 1960 at age 30 had the same remaining life expectancy and the 2000th person at age 40. So that's exactly a sort of support for this famous saying that 40s is a new 30s. You see it even here. In Korea it's even stronger. So you have it even, even stronger effect. It's even 40s is new 25s, something like that. So for some, this is for China, also it's similar, 40 is new, 25. Uh, well, there are some countries where the situation is completely opposite, and that's Russia. People are becoming older much faster, because a person in 2000 at age 40 had the same remaining life expectancy that someone at age 48, 60 years ago. So not every country going in that good direction. Now let's, let's, let's look, uh, have a look at the, how this whole story of aging looks like if we consider taking into account life expectancy increase and, so, and use these prospective measures of age. Now, so we can calculate prospective median age. Median age is an age, so we can have some standard and calculate this prospective median age, applying everything, looking at, uh, through the standard. So this is Switzerland. This is traditional median age. It goes up, definitely, according to traditional definitions, population is aging. This is prospective median age, the one which takes into account growing life expectancy. So it goes direct in opposite directions, so population instead of aging becomes younger. England and Wales, exactly the same story. So once you take into account lengthening life expectancy, you have very different picture of aging. Japan, 
also very similar story. So today, population is the same, old, in new measures as it was in 1947. Well, for projections, I just give some brief uh, projection um, pictures. So this is for Euro European Union uh, country with low mortality. This is prospective median age projections. This median age projections also going opposite direction, almost opposite direction. These are pictures for selected Asian countries. So this is median age. This is prospective median age. Everywhere, it's at least five or even more years less, even somewhere in the middle. Here, actually, I'm using we are using. Uh, United Nations forecasts, and we think that United Nations forecasts are extremely uh, pessimistic about future development of life expectancy. And this is, of course, very much linked to future forecasts of life expectancy. Now, second view. So we looked at the median age, and we sort of uh, discussed that how the median age and prospective median age give completely different measures. Second measure is population proportion of age 65. Now, so this is a proportion of age 65 in law mortality OECD countries. It's growing up. This is average. Now, how life expectancy was growing at age 65? For the same country, it's almost, you know, start increasing. Why? Because we know that for most of the countries with low mortality, most of mortality of, of our life expectancy increase goes due to sharp decrease in mortality in high ages, age 70, age 80. That's where most of the uh, mortality decline is observed. And that's exactly what is seen here. So population at age 65, life expectancy at age 65 is increasing. Now, this is average. Now, so we see here, basically, that at somewhere in 70s, we consider people old at age 65, and their remaining life expectancy was 15 years of age. Now, let's consider that the person is old when he is a population, when they have remaining life expectancy 15 years of age. So that's how uh, age at which remaining life expectancy was 15 years is developing. So you see, it was in 60s, yes, somewhere 65, but now it's above 70 for many countries. So which means, if you consider someone old at age 65 in the 60s, 70s, now this person is supposed to be old at age 72, 73, 71. And that's overall picture. And this is up to, two, so now it will go even here, to be somewhere here. Now, so let's look, let's now fix this age 15 and assume that the person is old when he has remaining life expectancy 15 years of age or population. So that's how the proportion of people age uh, with remaining life expectancy less than 15 years of age is developing for OECD countries. Basically, there is no growth. This is average. So there is no aging the moment we take into account uh, lengthening life expectancy, whether we look at one measure, which is median age, whether we look at the proportion of older people, once the threshold of who is old is being redefined. And this is, by the way, just this sort of trash uh, in inflation of age, of old age, you can say. This is the, the, the speed of, of moving the threshold of being old in, for some European countries. You see, for many of them, this high life expectancy is about two years per decade. The threshold is moving. Okay, so these are projections. Some of the projections is age 65 plus for European countries. That's uh, proportion of 65 plus. That's proportion of uh, with remaining life expectancy 15. Very different picture. It still grows, but completely different way. Old age dependency for all European countries. Traditional one, and that's what we call prospective old age dependency. Almost constant. So once we take into account that, that the people are different. Okay, probably I skip this because I have a little bit less time. Now, these are the champions of aging. This is from European demographic data sheet that we are uh, producing uh, in Vienna. So these are traditional measures of aging, old age dependency ratio. The champions uh, today, 2013, Italy, Germany, of course, everything is compared, but it's Japan, the, the leader. Uh, and this is 2015 forecast. Again, this is proportion. This is old age dependency. Japan is, of course, leading. And here we have other countries, the same countries, basically, Italy, Spain, Greece. Now, if we'll introduce and use this prospective measure, when we take into account the threshold is linked to life expectancy, the picture of who is old is completely different. These are East European countries, basically. They are the oldest now, and they are the oldest in the future. 
so these are some of the forecasts here we I use UN data because here it's, it's what we did ourselves for Europe these are UN data so again I think they're a little bit conservative so this is proportion 65 plus this is proportion with remaining life expectancy 15 years or less so it's very very different picture and this is a picture of aging um, where we have 60, uh, MEP, 65 plus, 2010. It's mostly all blue except Japan. This is traditional measure, 2015. It's becoming very different color. This is proportion when you use this threshold, moving threshold, new measures of age. It's, it's very different. Populations are aging much less. And especially it will be in, with old age dependency ratio. So traditional old age dependency ratio and old age dependency ratio when they use different definition of age. Okay. Uh, and the picture, of course, that's old age dependency, 2010, except Japan, everything is blue. This is traditional measure, and this is old age dependency when they use new measure. Almost no change. Because here it affects two subgroups. It affects this moving threshold, it affects people in the working ages and it affects also people in, in older ages. So the relation is the ratio is even stronger affected by this new definition. And this is relative change, perspective old age dependent uh, in, in old age dependency. So it's if this one increases I think for is uh, Iran, that's the fastest aging. It's about eight and here no, not a single country reaches four. Now that was sort of introduction to this more general approach that we should not look at people as being the same at the same age. We should look at characteristics of people. So the person today at age 60 and the person 100 years ago and the person 100 years from now, they are very different people. I only looked, that was introduction, uh, I only looked at one of the characteristics of population, remaining life expectancy. But aging is a multidimensional process. We can look at health, we can look at cognitive abilities. So these are all called characteristics of people. And what we basically have to rely on uh, our research on aging, we have really to look at characteristics of people and not at their chronological age. Because women in Sweden at age 60 today is very different from women at age 60 in Sweden 150 years ago. Or she's very different from a woman who is living today, say, in Niger, even today. So it's uh, just two different worlds. So we cannot say that this is dependency ratio just based on one characteristic chronological age. And that's why uh, we sort of introduced this whole characteristic approach, where we look at characteristics of people. Life table measures could be just one of the characteristics. But there are many other measures. In a second, I still have a couple of minutes. I will show one of the pictures. So, but these are, for example, different life table characteristics which bring us to different measures of age. For example, this is for Republic of Korea. Uh, what is it? We call it alpha ages. So what it is? We look, what is characteristic according to remaining life expectancy? This is EX. Remaining life expectancy, just what I showed before. But we are not, we are just looking what is in 2010. What is remaining life expectancy for 60 year old person in, South, in Republic of Korea? And then we look, what is the age in the future and what was the age in the past that gives us exactly the same remaining life expectancy. And that's what we have here. This is green line. We can look also, so this is age which is basically sort of the same. We call it prospective age. Well, now we call it alpha age because it is linked to many different characteristics. If you look at characteristic mortality rate, so mortality rate of someone in Korea at age 65 in 2010 at age 65, was the same at age 55, say only about uh, 20 years ago. Or it will be at age 80, say in 2100, as it is projected. So there are different characteristics that we should apply at different situations. So at each particular situation, we should look at different characteristics. If we are interested in cognitive abilities of people, we should have sort of similar characteristics. But this characteristic approach allows us to combine all those characteristics because we can bring them to the same unique metric. And this metric is age. And uh, um, maybe I skip this. This was one of our papers where we use this approach, characteristic based approach, to compare subgroups of people. 
These are based on HRS survey, United States Health and Retirement Survey, where we looked at hand grip. Actually, a few days ago, there was a paper which showed that hand grip uh, is a very good proxy, even for mortality outcome. It was published in Lancet. Actually, we are also working in this direction because we think hand grip is a really, hand grip strength is a really, really very good measure of upper body strength, but in general of aging and in general of health. What we have here, we have two subgroups. Uh, we have population more educated, males and females, and population less educated. So what we found out, that hand grip strength of the person at age almost 66, educated person, is the same as the one at age 60, six years or younger, less educated. Which means that in terms of physical conditions, at least of the upper body, this the person have the same they are about the same age. So someone with less education is aging much faster. And here you have, of course, for all ages. At the end, it all sort of comes to, to zero difference. But this is partly to selection, because people with low education they have usually a little bit higher mortality. Initially, you were sort of shocked. Why is it so? Because you would expect that person who is sort of with less education does a lot of manual work, he's stronger. And this is true at younger ages. But by age of 60, due to very different lifestyle, to very different diet, to very different taking care of health, going fitness, whatever, people with high education, their lifestyle is very different, and they really become stronger. And this is observed also in all countries, and share uh, in European countries, so that's, um, so it's general. So using this characteristic approach, we can compare the speed of aging of different subgroups, for example. And we do the same for cognitive things, for many different things. Uh, I'm running out of time, out of time. So this is just basically a conclusion that population aging is, is of course a, a source for many challenges in 21st century, but we should not uh, uh, exaggerate it using wrong measures. And uh, we should address problems much better if we use broader scope of, of measures. And this is just one of the approaches. And uh, if there is some interest, there is additional information of what we have done in this direction. That's it, thank you.